we wanted to shift people's relationships with their stuff. And we had done so many experiments on ourselves and our families to try to cut down waste, to try to reduce our consumption of single use plastics, to try to share things. And we independently had a couple of different experiences that gave us some insight into what it might really take to shift our relationship with our stuff. Hello, welcome to People Planet Profit, a podcast by Earth Up, where we aim to help businesses and people like you simplify sustainability. Earth Up CEO Stephen Bay will be joined by experts, innovators, and lifelong adventurers to break down some of today's biggest topics affecting the triple bottom line of people, planet, and profits. What does a sick building do to your health? Why should corporations be invested in biodiversity? How can I help create better working conditions and happier employees at my company? We'll cover these questions and so much more in a candid conversation about reshaping work culture into a landscape that prioritizes people and planet without sacrificing profit. Our next episode starts right now. Hey, it's Stephen Bay, CEO of Earthup. Today's episode features the dynamic duo and co-founders of the Buy Nothing Project, Liesl Clark and Rebecca Rockefeller. The Buy Nothing Project was created as an experimental, hyper-local gift economy on Bainbridge Island, Washington, back in 2013. Since then, it has become a worldwide social movement with groups in 44 different nations around the world. Liesl, Rebecca, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. Thanks for having us. Thank you so much for having us. Let's start with the origin story. What is your background and how did you come up with the Buy Nothing Project? Well, I am Rebecca Rockefeller and I'm here with my very good friend, Liesl Clark. And the two of us met years ago, originally through our local free cycle group. Liesl kept offering things that I was the only one who wanted them. And then I would offer something and Liesl would be the only person who wanted it. And we kept picking things up from each other's driveways. And then one day we met in person. I think it was over a big, messy pile of curly willow twigs that I had pruned off of a tree in my backyard. And no one else wanted what I was offering. <laughs> the free cycle moderator was always telling me, that's not an appropriate item. You can't give that. It's not, it doesn't have enough value. And I would be like, but <laughs> this woman wants it. So obviously it does have value. So we, we finally met that way. And then we ended up connecting in a more meaningful way when we participated in our school district's homeschool partnership program. So our kids were able to join a cohort of their peers and we did homeschooling together. So that is where we started as sort of a citizen science project that I will let Liesl take over and talk about. That was sort of the genesis of what we're doing now with Buy Nothing. So we uh, had a passion for exploration and we would take our kids along the shorelines of Bainbridge Island. And we discovered on our walks along the shoreline a lot of plastic. You know, we asked the question with our kids, where, what, where is this plastic coming from? So we started to collect it in bags and the kids would sort it out. When we asked the question, not only where is this plastic coming from, but what are these plastics? Because many of them were indecipherable because they had broken down into tiny, tiny little bits and pieces. And we were able to answer that question with our kids uh, based on this spreadsheet that we put together. And we saw that these plastics were coming from us, from our homes, from our cars, from our workplaces, from our streets and down into the drains that would empty out into Puget Sound or in our watersheds. They would go down from the little streams into our waters. And we are all now learning that there are plastics out in our oceans, um, little tiny microplastics, all big ones turn into little ones and they break down into smaller and smaller pieces. And the microplastics are outnumbering zooplankton four to one. So there are aquatic fish and um, other, you know, all the way up to whales that are eating these plastics. And so they are becoming a certain percentage plastic and we are becoming a certain percentage plastic. We then ask the question of ourselves, what can we do? What can we do as citizens? We could just say no more to any plastics at all. And that wasn't really reasonable, but I think we were able to come up with this idea of, you know, there's reduce, reuse, recycle. And we thought, how about if we refuse? And so Rebecca started the first Facebook Buy Nothing group and we invited our friends and we asked them to invite their friends and we started sharing immediately. People were sharing not only the plastics, but they were sharing their produce and clothing and housewares. And within 
days, we had hundreds of members. And within days after that, we had over a thousand members. And then another group started and we and we scaled it very quickly, all modeled after the same model of the original group. That's so cool. And I just love the name by nothing too, because you don't try to lead with, you know, be sustainable or all the million names that you guys could have come up with. So the buy nothing just associates with what people all care about, which is not spending money or reducing their spend. So one, that's brilliant. And you've seen it with other companies now too, where they don't really talk about sustainability, but that's the additional benefit from this. As an avid user of Buy Nothing, my family does it all the time. It's great to hear the origin story. I know you guys are operating in 44 different countries now. If you go look on the Buy Nothing website, it's insane just the reach you guys have have been able to accomplish. Was there marketing in there? Is this all just word of mouth growth? Kind of how did you guys do that? And then how do you guys manage that? We believe that the Buy Nothing Project, which we refer to mostly as a social movement, is probably one of the largest non-monetized, entirely volunteer run movements in the world that we can find. So we've done no marketing. None of us have ever been paid a penny. None of the people who are working to bring this to life are compensated in cash in any way. And I actually think that that is foundational to the success of this movement. Everybody who comes to this to start a group hears about it through word of mouth. I think it's proof of the fact that there's a very strong connection between human beings that spans the globe, that we've done no marketing. And yet this idea um, has spread all over. And partly that's because it's an ancient idea. This isn't something that we invented. A gift economy is present in pretty much every indigenous culture throughout history. And many of them are still intact now. So we did not, in no way did we invent this concept, but it's a concept that a lot of people living in industrialized countries are no longer have access to. So I think it's we've tapped into this sort of ancient cord. And then we've also tapped into the fact that people talk to each other all over the world. We have friends in different countries, word spreads quickly. And that's what you can see proof of that and how this has grown around the globe. Liesl might have something more to say about how we scale this and how we have supported it. Through the incredible help and volunteerism of um, people who are really passionate about these ideas, we've been able to respond to just about everyone who contacts us and says, I'd like to set one up in my community. So now we even have, um, you know, a training program. There's an online course that people can take at their own uh, speed, and that's available with support. There are people standing by <laughs> ready to help you to um, set up your community uh, on uh, any platform. Uh, we have been prevalent on Facebook. But the next step is that we are building our own platform from scratch and we're asking people to join us in the Buy Nothing app that will be available for anybody to use on their rectangular device. Uh, and we're basically trying to spread the ideas even more because, you know, Facebook is one platform, but there are a lot of people who are not on Facebook. And, and in terms of accessibility, we'd like to really move this into as many people's homes as possible. My wife is the one that primarily you know, interacts with Buy Nothing because I do not have a Facebook. And so I think that's a great idea. For all the people listening right now that are not on Buy Nothing, how do they sign up? How, what's that process look like? So now we are encouraging people to sign up at Buy Nothing app. Dot com and sign up on our wait list. We will be launching the beta version of the app to eight communities around the globe. So our dream is to roll it out to these eight different, you know, diverse communities and test it out, make sure the, the boat floats, and then we'll do a global launch probably late July, early August. That's great. And have you talked with members to really understand the impact it's making to reduce the waste that you guys were talking about originally? Have you guys done some sort of metrics or some sort of wide way to quantify that on a per family basis. One of the things we're really excited about with the app that we're building is that we're able to put that metric collection in there. One of the things we really want to be able to do is document for everybody what their impact is. There are a lot of problems that we have that require systemic solutions, but there's also a lot of room for us as individuals to have impact. And when we get together and we share resources, we can have an immediate 
pretty profound impact. I believe that being able to document what that impact is, is going to make it possible for us to even, you know, enlarge it to make it bigger. When you know what your gas mileage is, you drive more carefully and you get better mileage. When we're able to document for everybody what we're diverting and what that's doing for our planet and our communities, I think we're going to be able to scale that impact way up. So that's one of the things we're most excited about. And I would add that I think that municipalities are interested in this, trying to understand how technology and community building can bring us together, as Rebecca says, in these collective actions so that then we can somehow quantify, for example, you can do it by, of course, the municipalities are like Seattle Public Utilities. They're interested in finding out by type. So how much wood, how much metal, how much, how, you know, the plastics, the glass, the textiles, all of those in their various waste streams, how much of that by tonnage is being diverted from the landfill. There's a way for technology to uh, create some metrics so that your community can know as well as the broader public utilities. So it's not just the one time usage. It's how many different times can the same product get used where it would go straight into a landfill historically. And I couldn't agree with you guys more about having metrics associated with that. If I could see how many items we've given, if I could see how many items we've received, and then you get to start to see the, the impact metrics that go with that on an individual basis and then a community basis, that's pretty dang cool. Was reducing waste your primary intent when developing by nothing? Or was it something else that you guys were focused on, like local living and community building? So that community aspect was actually our primary intent. And I think that that's what sets us apart. We wanted to shift people's relationships with their stuff. And we had done so many experiments on ourselves and our families to try to cut down waste, to try to reduce our consumption of single use plastics, to try to share things. And we independently had a couple of different experiences that gave us a, an, some insight into what it might really take to shift our relationship with our stuff. Both of our, our independent experiences, the common thread in all of them was that what we wanted to offer, what we thought it would take to do this was something that would fill the hole that so many of us are trying to fill with stuff, with single-use plastics, with little doodads and tchotchkes, and also just with the idea that capitalism ingrains in us that our identity is tied directly to our consumption of virgin plastic goods and brand new items made out of other materials as well. It sort of is like we need to give people a new definition definition of themselves that doesn't have to do with how much they hoard in their own homes, but with how much they share, with how generous they are, with how humbly they can receive, with how easily they can share and give and ask. We wanted to put our items in the context of relationships between people because it's those relationships between people that make life good. It builds trust. It takes us out of a scarcity mindset and puts us into this abundance mindset. Those are all things that make us more joyful. So what we really wanted was to experiment to see if we could basically make people happier, connect people, make them happier, and secretly get them to use less stuff and have a better impact on the world. But we wanted, we wanted to enter it from what we thought was the most foundationally important point. And as more of us adopt technologies, it seems that we are continuously removed from like the physical surroundings, our communities specifically. I've lived in a few neighborhoods where we never saw any neighbors, but the interaction is a social interaction. It's not a market interaction. As companies are moving, this is an issue that companies are dealing with as they have employees working from home. And one of the things companies are really trying to focus on is community. How do you maintain community? How do you maintain culture outside of the workspace? How can you strengthen that sense of community? So one of the things that our app will allow people to do is to center or include their workplaces and their work communities in a, a gift economy. And giving and sharing, as we've been talking about, is a really amazing way for people to feel connected. It's an amazing way to build a group identity and to build a group culture that's rooted in generosity and trust, which are all things that benefit companies. I'm really excited to see our ideas and our resources and our platform used by entities of all sorts in order to sort of further cement their bonds and to further grow their own culture. 
totally agreed. I think that there is a, a, the ability in in the app now, whether they're large businesses or small businesses, where um, even the business entity could join, but as a person behind that business, because we want to know who the people are who are running the businesses. So certainly in a small family owned, individually owned business, that's something that would enable your community members to know the face of the business. So my neighbor is an, an owner of a coffee shop and I wouldn't have known that but for actually interacting with this person through the Buy Nothing community. And then I saw that person in real life and realized, oh, there you are. And so this is what you do. Once we're all moving back into the workplace, I would say to directors of sustainability to allow for people to bring some of their home into the business, meaning share. You can share within the business itself, but you could come with items from your home to literally have a little open sharing table, or you could have community potlucks. You could put out a little clothing share like for kids. I just think any excuse for sharing and borrowing and lending always brings people together. I agree. I think if a company just introduces a, a solution like your guys, is they, it can help them accomplish a lot of their goals. A lot of companies are trying to get employees to rally around their sustainability efforts, but it's hard to really create that connection because it's like, Hey, we reduced our emissions. We're net zero versus, hey, we're helping you reduce your plastic usage at home. And trying to really draw that connection, I think, is important. And I highly recommend anybody listening that's in a sustainability department to recommend Buy Nothing. I'm excited for your guys' app. Do you guys have any thoughts when it comes to your product and how it supports a lot of things on a global level that we're trying to accomplish? We're very interested in replicating the idea of sharing communities, sharing cities. I think that businesses can do the same thing. So, for example, we saw in Australia, the capital city of Canberra, they created a sharing city. There is a, an actual worldwide initiative called Sharing Cities. And what they did was they created a map for the citizens of the city to find all of the shareable initiatives within that map. I think that you could scale that down to actual corporations as well. So for example, on this map for Canberra, you would find where all of the different buy nothing sharing communities were. You could see where all the little free libraries were. So again, now scale it all down to a corporation, for example. And I think that this is something that every single business entity can do. You can have a little free library. I used to work at uh, WGBH as a producer for Nova. And so there we would, a lot of us were gardeners and we would bring in our excess produce. And there were families that worked for the company that had food insecurity. I loved sharing what I could bring to the table and then I could take whatever um, was available too. So always thinking in terms of sharing, it's those kinds of like business to peer initiatives that I think, as well as the sh kind of sharing city initiatives uh, that co corporations and municipalities can all do. We've done a few surveys of our global participants in the Buy Nothing movement. And one of the first questions we asked was, what do people do with the money they save through participating in their local Buy Nothing community? Our hypothesis was that if we have a vibrant gift economy in every community around the world, people will will save money. And we believed that they would use that money locally to support local development, local growth through supporting um, local nonprofits that they may not have been able to otherwise donate to, supporting local businesses, sort of all of the icing on the cake experiences that a lot of us don't have the resource, the financial resources for. If we are freed up thanks to Buy Nothing, what happens to spending in our local communities? And the answer to the survey that we got some help from a data scientist to frame the questions well, and the information we got back said, yes, that's exactly what's happening. That when you have a vibrant gift economy that is parallel to your local market economy, that gift economy benefits development of sustainable businesses locally, sustainable and, and cultural endeavors and artistic endeavors. So in the three different phases of work moving forward, which I really believe are going to be office, co-working spaces and work from home, do you see kind of this, this community that you guys are trying to create of gift giving as an employee benefit that they could leverage across all three spaces? Absolutely. The sky's the limit in terms of ways that we can all benefit from that. When you start taking stock of all of these kind of disposable type items or the, the items that you reuse within the corporate environment, I think it's important that any sustainability director is actually really looking at that and thinking about, well, perhaps we could source some of this as um 
secondhand items that are perfectly still usable. Every business does have waste. If you're a manufacturer, you will have particular kinds of waste. Let's say there's a small company that makes wallets from bicycle tire tubes. Well, that's an item that regular individuals might be throwing away. Don't toss it because you could use your buy nothing community as a business and say, we want to be the go-to place for any buy nothing community within 20 miles. We want you to know you can always drop that off because we will we make wallets, we make purses out of this item. And I think that we can start thinking more in ter- terms of the circular economy for for businesses to receive from individuals, but vice versa. So there are corporations, they might be moving out of a building. We were given an example in Brooklyn of a company that had a um, hundred ficus trees. Okay, a hundred ficus trees and they were live ficus trees. Well, that's, that's bulk. But I think we can set ourselves up to be able to take that on as a company, as an app. So that would mean, you know, if you're in a big city, for example, in Seattle, there are, from our metrics we found, there are a hundred thousand people who are in buy nothing groups and there are a hundred groups. So again, a hundred ficus trees, they'd be gone in about five minutes. If you posted in about 10 groups, then uh, all the people who are relatively close in that, in those neighborhoods would come to the business. They would learn about the business. So the business gets some sort of public outreach benefit. The uh, neighbors who live in proximity to that business will feel good and get to know some of the people who are working within that business. So that's our dream is that we could set up this platform so that businesses themselves can start Start sharing with each other. I think the more we start talking about the things that we are normally have called waste and companies start talking about things that they would prefer not to buy. And if it's out there in the sharing stream, I won't call it a waste stream because people think of that in negative terms, but we could start creating this sharing city resource where you know where to go to drop things off, you know who to meet, and you know how to ask for certain things. And even corporations could could post uh, items and big bulk items like, okay, we've got 20 desks. Well, we're all working from home. Maybe we could use one of those desks. We've spoken to a few companies that are trying to make headway in this space. And one thing that they're worried about is the pickup. Like you really do need to know that if you're giving away 20 desks, that that other company is going to come and pick them up. I think we can solve all of those problems. If that's one of the biggest problem is, you know, actually making that transaction happen. I'm convinced that we can make that happen. I think what you're saying isn't something that companies would be like, oh, we could do this. I think companies would love to be able to do this because they are essentially enforcing that triple bottom line that their executives want them to do. They're the the investors are telling them, consumers are telling them to focus on. Everything you said really aligns with the people. How do you get back to the people? How do you get people to come to your location, pick stuff up and you're part of that community? Profit, more people are coming to your location. They are going to be seeing you as a brand. They're going to become consumers of your guys' solutions. And then the planet, you're you're reducing tons of usage. So even just the the business, the peer-to-peer, leveraging that ability and using your location to allow that to happen, or if it's business giving back to the individuals, or if it's business to business, I think companies should and will be excited about all three of those different aspects. Again, it's the it's the input versus the output. And if you can do an audit, and um, this is something that we we love doing, believe it or not, it's kind of a weird passion. But um, but once you can start to see that, okay, all of those excess books that are public library is giving away. We were able to connect them with books for prisons, for example, or even at our landfill there. They had a little um, walk-in container where you could take your excess books. We would go into schools and do waste audits. And that was really fun because then the kids were involved. We have chickens. So in my kids' classroom, that was easy. They just bring in a chicken bucket every day and the kids would love giving the food, their excess food. Of course, they're supposed to eat it, but they don't eat it all. So Most of the kids were instructed and learned, if you haven't really touched it, bring it home. Show your mom that you're not actually eating all of that. Then, you know, show your dad and then he won't put that much food into your into your 
your lunch because it's just too much. You can't, you're not going to eat an entire apple. But the chicken bucket was really successful because, you know, there were half eaten things and those could go to our chickens and we could bring in eggs to share with the classroom. And then they started to see the things that they could reuse and try to repair. Even magic markers they could put in water for five minutes and then, wow, it's, it's totally revived. And now that magic marker doesn't have to be thrown away. So they started to think about the things that could be recycled, the things that could be reused and the, and the things that could be you know taken out. We reduced those classrooms to just about zero waste. We can scale it and do the same for corporations. It's amazing to see the impact that you guys have made starting locally with your guys' community and really building it to something that has significantly improved the world. So congratulations with that. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. It's been fun talking with you. Um, well, now it's time for the quick hitters section. Uh, you guys ready? Ready. Go for it. What gets you up in the morning? <laughs> Responsibilities. <laughs> <laughs> my my kids and working on this app, which is a, a new endeavor, which is really fun. What's your breakfast beverage? Ooh, for me, tea during the week and coffee on the weekends. Uh, well, a smoothie, believe it or not. I like to have, yeah, a kale and uh, blackberry, local blackberry smoothie. Um, any books that you guys would like to recommend? Well, shamelessly, I'd like to pitch the book we wrote, <laughs> which we really is a primer for all of those things. So it's called The Buy Nothing, Get Everything Plan. But also, I just, I'm really late to the game. People have been telling me for years to read Braiding Sweetgrass. That book is both beautiful and profound, and I think it has some really amazing messages about the nature of gift economies, believe it or not. It's a book mostly about botany, but it's also really about our relationship with the world and our things and ourselves. And it's written by um, Robin Wall Kimmerer, and I would second that and also just say that she has an essay called The Service Berry, which would be a, a nice introduction to her writing, which is about the gift economy mindset. What's one thing you would recommend people do in their daily routines that they'd be surprised to find out is actually pretty eco-friendly? Reduce food waste. Food waste is a major, major driver of climate change, and it's one area where we have massive ability to impact it. And following on that, I would say also just once you do that, then look at all of your waste. So everything has value. So looking at your your own waste in new ways, so things that you might typically throw away, someone else might actually want. I mean, even those yogurt cups, art teachers will probably take them. You could start sort of saving up certain things, but also kind of the bigger things that you just think, oh, no, you know, nobody's ever going to wear this. There are textile recycling facilities, too. So you never need to throw away a, a textile ever. Do the planet a favor and just rethink just about everything you throw away. Is there anything you guys want to plug or any new technologies from an individual? You, you know, I know everybody's going to be excited about the app that you guys have coming out. Is there any other technologies that you think are really cool right now? You know, honestly, I'm so focused on building this app that that is literally, <laughs> I haven't had enough time to, to think about other things. That's a really great question. I wish I had a great answer. Yeah, me too. I would say maybe taking steps away from technology and just getting out in the great outdoors and taking some deep breaths. And we're all so inside and zooming all the time, just balancing that and the, the technologies with what the outdoors and what the real, the natural world has to offer or your relationships with your neighbors. And so use technology to do, to do that, but then get out. You guys have changed the world and I think it's only just begun and it's really, really cool. You've made an impact in my life. I think there's a lot of ways we can have employers really make an impact through the metrics that you guys are going to gather. And yeah. I'm excited. So thank you very much. Likewise. Thank you. Take care. And that's our episode. If you'd like more info about the Buy Nothing Project and their new app, visit buynothingproject.org. EarthUp's new platform that simplifies sustainability for companies and communities is now live. To jump into the platform and start making change at home and work, go to app.earthup.eco. Become an early adopter and help us create an easier, more effective, and more fun platform for our community. Thank you so much for listening in and for your support. If you like our show, hit that subscribe button, tell a friend, and rate and review us wherever you get your podcasts. Your support helps us reach a wider audience. So thank you. To learn more about EarthUp and our journey to launching our new platform, visit earthup.eco and follow EarthUp on LinkedIn.